Okay, welcome to this NACE webinar focusing on element five of the EdTech Review Framework Professional Development. I'm Sarah Morgan, I'm a board member of NACE, and today we are joined on the call with our colleagues from Competeam um, as we discuss the challenges and the opportunities in supporting teachers with their effective use of digital technologies. Rather than me introduce our colleagues, if we start off with Gavin Hawkins, please. Hi Sarah, so uh, I'm Gavin, uh, I'm currently the chair of NACE um, and uh, a board member. Um, my day job is around supporting schools with education technology strategy um, and then obviously supporting, supporting NACE with their, with their wider work. Uh, okay. Shall we move over to Owen from CompuTeam? Yeah, hi uh, Sarah. So I'm Owen Napier. I'm the CEO of CompuTeam. CompuTeam is an edtech managed service provider. It's been working in the sector for about 25 years to try and improve education outcomes using uh, technology. Obviously, I set the strategic direction for the organisation, but I also um, keep my hand in uh, by doing a fair bit of consultancy for schools and multi-academy trusts across England. Lovely, thanks for joining us, Owen. And Mandy? Hi, I'm Mandy Jackson. Um, I also work for CompuTeam as Education and Training Lead. Um, so prior to this role, I was a real-life teacher um, for uh, 14 years and a middle leader. And from that experience of using technology within the classroom and leading that, I've moved into EdTech full-time um, to now support schools by providing consultancy on how they can grow their digital transformation strategies and ensure that the CPD and training that we um, offer and deliver is very specific and purposeful for them um, to kind of elevate their needs of their trust or school. Fantastic. Well, as a senior leader in, um, in a school myself currently, as assistant head teacher, um, in a school that, that is looking at ways to develop digitally all the time, I'm really excited to be part of this call. So if we start off, um, sometimes it is tricky for leaders in schools to find the time and perhaps the budget to provide all the CPD requirements that are needed throughout the academic year. And um, how would NACE and Competeam advise leaders to prioritise the needs for their digital development? Shall we start off with NACE? Um, yeah, thanks, Sarah. So, <clears throat> so, so it is one of the biggest challenges, isn't it? Because um, you're juggling both the time implications and your resource capacity against essentially a large investment in education technology and ensuring that that investment is is having positive outcomes. So, you know, when I was still a real teacher and still a an, an, an senior leader in school, um, it's very much about ensuring that you're not overwhelming staff, but but identifying those small gain, gains. So, so, for example, you know, having those conversations with teachers about what's in it for them. So what is it that is good for, what can they do um, and what professional development can they engage with that is going to impact directly on their practice? And where you've got those very small gains being made, that's leading up to a big whole school, a big whole school picture. So whilst the individual staff themselves may not be seeing that whole picture, you as a leader, it's critical that you are. It's critical that you're setting those 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 aims and sharing them with staff, but then being really focused, I think, in what it is that you're looking to achieve just from those individual members of staff who might be looking to make those those small improvements in their practice. Have we got colleagues who'd like to add anything further there? Yeah, absolutely. I think um Exactly as you said there, Gavin, um, smaller, very specific goals rather than big, overwhelming targets is an approach we ourselves at Competeam use. We use a system called Transformation Metrics, which is essentially using um, the trust or school improvement plan to really pick apart some ideas of what are the pain points, what would you actually like to improve through technology rather than technology being this add-on that adds additional workloads, making sure that time is really valued in that. Um, 
And on that kind of time point, I would also say that having that really flexible training approach, so we know that lots of careers are now offering flexible working methods, and there is always a place for face-to-face -face training. But um, one of the things that, that we at CompuTeam have is a product called Learning Locker, um, which is a, an asynchronous training platform, and that allows staff to access um, complementary training 24 hours a day, um, at a self-paced uh, level, and that complements all of the programs that we um, ourselves put into the schools and trusts. So it's that really offering that flexibility of time for staff um, and allowing them to access that at a time that suits them as well. Fantastic, and I, I, th I think you're absolutely right. Workload and that, that work-life balance for teachers, you know, is priority at the moment for leaders in school as well. So. Sounds good. If we just move this on and how how leaders in schools um, themselves, when they're making these decisions to roll out either the CPD or making those those choices for technology, how can leaders keep up to date and, 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 and avoid a digital decline that might happen with their lack of knowledge, of lack of keeping up to date because they haven't got the time to do that? Um, any advice there for leaders? Yeah, I can chip in on this one, Sarah. So... I, th I think the first thing is to start from uh, start from a position of of knowledge in what the outcomes are that you're looking to achieve as a school. So we, we've all been in the industry a long time. I'm sure we've all seen our fair share of technology solutions looking for problems. And I think it's important to remember that a school leader is already going to know the challenges that they want to tackle. So don't just do digital for digital's sake. That said, mm -hmm. if you if you do want to go out and find out what's possible and, and what other schools are doing well then you, know, you, you can't do much better than visiting uh, one of the major trade shows that we have uh, in the country. So you've got um, the Schools and Academy show, you've got the BET show, and being able to go and I think network with other colleagues and hear you know, their pain points, what's worked, what hasn't worked. Uh, and that can really help, I think, get a targeted list of areas that a school leader might want to invest in. Lovely, thank you. Can I just chip in on that, Sarah? Because I think that's really important because one of the things that, that as a profession I think we do quite badly actually is sharing good practice. Um, I don't think, you know, the, when you think about the sheer number of schools just in the UK system, you know, the, over 30,000 of them and, and a huge percentage of those will be doing outstandingly innovative things. Um, and I, I'm never convinced that we, we capture that well. Um, you know, leaders are possibly involved in lots of, lots of informal groups and, and informal sharing, but that, but that gathering, that, 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 or it's almost that, um, that psyche of, of, of action research as well and sharing it and under, undertaking something and then sharing it more formally that is actually embedded within some some of the other education systems globally, you know, that, that exists elsewhere. And I just wonder whether, you know, that's something that really as a profession, as an organ, you know, as a, as a collective is, is probably something we really ought to consider better. It's a great point, Gavin. And one other thing I was going to say is uh, most schools have a couple of organisations they work with that might look a bit like CompuTeam. And we work with about 500 schools and academies uh, and mats across the country. And I'll often say that, you know, the best ideas are not ours. They're often things that we take from one mat or school into another. So I, I completely agree with your, your point, Gavin, that there, there needs to be more of that um, action research and peer-to-peer and, and -peer sharing. But, there, you know, your managed service provider might well be a useful conduit for, for that. Yeah. Excellent. I think brilliant. And that's helping leaders see what's possible, because sometimes if you don't understand um, in, in a great detail, if you can see what's possible, you can then start putting your vision together for your school, perhaps. Lovely. Schools are very different, as we've just mentioned, um, and leaders um, need to be confident in the training that it's going to be personalised and, and fit their school because schools are so different. Mm -hmm. um, what advice do you have for leaders there in making sure that what they get, they're given is not just off the shelf and one size fits all? It's going to be personalised for them. I think for us, staff voice is, is absolutely key. Um, we, when we look at our transformation and training projects, 
we make sure that staff audit and staff voice is at the forefront of that. Um, quite often, schools or trusts might be very eager to throw some training in straight away to get the staff up to speed. And we are very adamant that we would like to do the audit first. Our audits are also uh, bespoke and tailor-made to each school and each trust. You know, I don't have a generic Microsoft or Google form that just gets thrown out um, to every school. We work with the school to make sure that, you know, you've been in a school where you can be Microsoft form to death um, and people are just sent form after form to find out information. And is that data used? Similarly to how we look at data for children, how is that data actually used and what is it used for? So we will only ask a question on an audit if we know it's going to be something that we're going to track over time. And it's linking into one of our specific transformation metrics, one of our specific pain points. Um, because then, you know, we don't want staff to spend a lot of time filling in a form where that data goes nowhere. So really specific targeted questions that are tailor made to the school um, that are then revisited at, you know, agreed times. So whether that's biannual or if it's a five year project, it might be once a year. Um, and that gives us that measure, um, and we might track that on something like um, a Power BI dashboard, or we might track it through um, some Microsoft Analytics or something, to dependent on, on the trust to see where that could go as well. Can I just ask something there, Mandy? Because because uh, you know yeah. that's really important. So is that so that that data that you're collecting that 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 tracking of data that's mm -hmm. presumably shared at school level and and trust level is it yes yeah so that we um if we were working on a larger project we would usually usually elect um a, a small collective group of staff across the trust so maybe it's the ceo maybe it's um a couple of head teachers a couple of classroom teachers to kind of create a uh, what I like to say, a democratic voice of, of across the trust to, to implement a strategy. And then from there, that all that data and that report is um, collated by ourselves and shared with that transformation and training group. So at some schools and trusts, they share that with all staff um, and some it's kind of kept at a leadership level. And that's, again, that bespoke element of, of you know, that data is yours. It's from your staff voice. It's how you use that. Um, but it is always used. And that's the point. It's not data for collection's sake. It's it's always purposefully collected, tailor-made and, and used to either measure progress or inform training. So it, there might, you know, there's a couple of examples where schools have said, we want to focus on this. And then actually we've looked at the audit data and it's been completely opposite to what they thought their school was like. And we've had to do a U-turn and that's absolutely fine because that's the point of making sure um, all those schools are different and the training is personalized. It's not It's not going to stick if it's not right for you. So we need to make sure we've listened first. You made a good point earlier on about applying some of the things that schools are really good at and used to doing with pupils, like you know, evidence-based intervention and, and just applying that to this, this area. You know, just staff mm -hmm. training. It should be evidence based, should be backed up by metrics, and you should be really clear about what what you're going to try to achieve before you put in the training. And that is really interesting, is it? Because because for too long, you know, in some places there's still almost lip service being paid to that gathering of of, of staff voice, and you know, who who is the who's the professional development for? Is it for me as the leader because I think I need to do that? Um, but, you know, and very often with, with some schools are still in that cycle, that perpetual cycle of delivering training that might be the statutory stuff that obviously has to happen, yeah, but without really thinking about what is what are we doing strategically and how are we identifying what those strategic targets targets are? And I think if we're not careful, it's very easy as a senior leader, I think, to think the training that we're providing for staff, the professional development that we've got is, is working and it's great because nobody's complaining about it. Nobody's saying that they're, they're all very appreciative, but actually what's the impact and what's the impact on the individual? And I think that I think that gathering of staff voices is critical. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. Um, and I think that moves on a little bit to what I wanted to find out next. Um, I, I've been working in schools now for about 20 years and I've worked with lots of different leaders with their different styles. Um, but all of them, whenever I've gone into um, procurement of something called looking to purchase, I've always wanted to know hidden costs, hidden extras, what else is it going to cost them, um, the sustainability of something. So, so what advice have you got for somebody who in middle leader, leader of ed tech, something like that, who's going to be making these conversations and making the purchase to help? convince their leaders that this is the investment to go to and how to manage that. Um, I've been doing uh, ed tech uh, with schools for, for a similar amount of time, Sarah, so 20 years now. And yes, this is always a, a, a kind of a challenging issue around around budget and effectiveness and, uh, and, and really the outcome. And I think it comes back to that. The, the theme we've already discussed a few times is I think you start with the outcome. You know, start with where what you're looking to achieve and the evidence base. And, and I think the other one, which uh, sort of perhaps takes a bit of trust and a bit of bravery, is, is to be clear with your provider what, what sort of budget you have to address the problem. Mm -hmm. So you can often get into a bit of a, a sort of catch-22 guessing game where a proposal's put forward and you say that's a bit too high, or, you know, and you play this game. Actually, that, that refreshing honesty, this is how much we've got as a school to tackle this problem. And you know, m most providers in this sector care they're passionate about uh, making a difference and they'll you know they'll work out the best they can do within that budget envelope and and that can save an awful lot of time for, for both both parties excellent advice thank you um, and with leaders having so many priorities at the moment um, and being felt that they need to be held account for different areas how do you see ed tech fitting into that whole school um, this is something that I'm happy to take because it is something I'm always very passionate about where we very often see on a classic school improvement plan, there are four or five columns of these are the things we're going to tackle. And people quite often make the mistake of putting ed tech in its own column um, and having that as a, this is our priority for the year. Well, we know that at the end of the year, it's not going to, you know, we're not going to solve everything to do with ed tech. It's going to be actually on there if we treat it like that. And actually making it its own column makes it sound like it's its, its own problem. It's its own challenge. So it's a, it falls as its own piece of workload for us. Um, so a really good ed tech strategy doesn't sit in its own column. It completely threads horizontal against the whole strategy across all of the school priorities. And it actually becomes one of the action points for all of those other pain points, not a piece of workload in its own right. So I think seeing it as priority and a separate idea it is a common mistake that we see. Seeing it as an action and something we can implement and something to enhance and improve the other elements provides a supportive headspace and allows that ed tech to really wrap around everything else you're trying to do. Thank you, Mandy. That, that's just, really helped me visualise it myself <laughs> just, through, through, through your description. So thank you. I, I think I think it's worth just saying, actually, that this idea, it is really difficult, isn't it, as well, to disaggregate technology in its broadest sense from all of those things that are happening in schools. So, so you know, it is absolutely about school improvement in its broadest sense as well. And, and I think if if... It, it, Mandy, you're absolutely right. If if you are disaggregating it out and saying this is the, you know, this is where ed tech sits, then it just becomes another thing on that list. But actually, what should be happening is it should be sitting beneath those other things, and acting as the as the infrastructure, as the foundations to prop all of those other things up, because otherwise, you know, you, the investment that you're making, it's probably after your staffing costs. Costs on technology are probably really, really high within that top five percent of you of you of your expenditure. If that imp if that expenditure is not impacting on whole school improvement and change management, then you've seriously got to question why it is that you're investing X amount. You know, and it's also very difficult, isn't it, to disaggregate the impact that technology might have on particular things. You know, particularly on student outcomes, because because students are receiving 
so many interventions of which technology is part of that part of that jigsaw. So I think you're absolutely right. I, I just I don't think you can you can compartmentalise it in the way probably that schools have have traditionally done. It's also an ongoing commitment, isn't it, to, to make it continue to work. I think schools have got to be aware that they're budgeting for it and a bit of their budget each time needs to be put aside to make sure that they're keeping up with what needs to happen to maintain the surface given as well as being innovative down the line. Um, so just looking forward, how would you support a school who are looking to scale up I can take that one, Sarah. Digital. So CompuTeam do a lot of this work. That's that's sort of our raison d'etre, really, is, is to use technology to support school improvement. And I think, again, it goes back to that strategy piece and goes back to starting with a clear understanding of what your school improvement priorities are and then applying technology to those problems and thinking about how it can be scaled up. Um, so once you've set those priorities, everything else flows from there. Um, clearly, uh, the how, uh, you, you need to focus on the how, so what resources are available. We, we talked a little while ago about the, the fraught question of budget, availability of, of money, but also I think a really important thing is time. So giving perhaps middle leaders, giving staff the time to, um, to play and to use the technology before it goes live in the classroom. So think, think why strategy, think how, budget, time and resources. And, and then plan the what. So um, I think a, a kind of a, a joint action plan, something where staff know exactly what they're expected to do. And of course, involve your, your supply chain, involve trusted providers, um, hopefully like CompuTeam or, or other providers who have the knowledge and the expertise to support any scale up. Um, so uh, always, always start with that plan and I, and I think you can't, can't go too far wrong. Thank you. Let's just think about those leaders who, who are not ready to scale up, but are ready to take that first step, which sometimes can be the most daunting. Um, and it might be something that's out of your comfort zone a little bit. What advice have you got for those leaders taking that first step into their digital? I would say don't avoid it. <laughs> we see sometimes some inset trainings where school leaders, unfortunately, think that's for my staff. And you know, I'm not in the classroom. I'm not there but you have to walk the walk with your staff. Actually, one of my favorite terms is, is techno stress. And that's the that anxiety that somebody might have at the front of a classroom that if they don't get the technology, the pupils will know. And then I get so anxious about it that I just think, here's your paper booklet again. Um, and actually that it's okay to show that techno stress from a school leader to show your staff your vulnerabilities with technology that you are learning too. It can put them at ease and it actually creates that community within your school um, and an ethos that we're in this together. We're all learning. We're all exploring. You know, we're, we're pedagogy practitioners. We're all about learning. So let's embrace that ourselves as well. So I think making sure leaders don't kind of close the door on themselves and think this is for everybody else. They've got to really lead from the top on showing how to experiment and, and play around with technology as well. Can, can I be really parochial as well, Sarah, and just say that, you know, that obviously the, the, the NACE framework is deliberately designed, I think, in a way to support those those leaders that you've that you've spoken about, those who who, you know, are, are looking to um, take those steps. Mandy's absolutely right. Don't avoid it. Um, absolutely go for it. But. It is really difficult as well, isn't it? When you're the, you know, if you're the senior leader and you're sat in that chair in your office, it's quite a lonely place as well. So that, so having something that enables you to look um, purely, you know, sub objectively at your own school and say, where are we in our journey? Where, where, where do we fit? Um, what are the steps that we might want to be taking next? Um, where can we go for that support? And I think that's really important. You know, the thing that, that NACE does, I guess, is around that benchmarking. So that opportunity to say, OK, in all of these different elements of, of education technology, not all of which are specifically classroom practice related, where am I in all of those things? What are the quick wins? Because there will absolutely be some um, that won't be massively time um, um, 
impactful and massively resource heavy or budget heavy, there will be some things that you can do really relatively quickly whilst then looking at the bigger picture and thinking, OK, what are the what are the bigger challenging things? And the bigger challenging things are often around pedagogy. They're often around, you know, what does it look like in in classrooms? What's the impact? Um, you know, how do we know that young people are, uh, uh, and staff are using technology effectively? So I think I think that the the EdTech review framework is 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 beneficial for that. It's a useful starter. Um, but then at the other end, it's also very good. You know, the previous question where you spoke about scaling up that opportunity, I think, to identify, you know, where I, it's a maturity model. So where am I compared to other schools? Uh, how do I get to that level that could be considered to be outstanding practice? Um, and the opportunity, I think, to be awarded, you know, that, that the excellence mark, the NACE mark at, at that level. Thank you. Um, I think now, if we just draw to a close, if we, have we got any top tips, any, any CPD opportunities that our teachers and our leaders out there could, could once they finish the, the, the webinar with us today, they could take part in just to build their digital resilience, their digital strength, and just to start get going? Any top tips? I think as a, as a kind of summary comment from myself, it would be to only embark on any training if you fully understand how it fits into the overall strategy. Because if you just kind of throw around training and dip into things, that could be time really focused and targeted on something that works towards an outcome. So whatever that is through through Microsoft, Google, using something like our platform, Learning Locker or, or NACE CPD, just make sure you know why you're doing that and what impact you are aiming for. And I'd say if you, Thank you, Andy. you know, if you can, and I know it's it's a big ask, but if you can get some some time out of the classroom and some time out of the school, and go and attend, you know, one of the local trade shows. There's some there's some brilliant um, map networking events that are springing up around the country, and I certainly, when I go to those, I I come out of them quite inspired and seeing all that range of practice. So absolutely, go back to that point about having a clear strategy. But um, sometimes you just need an injection of inspiration and enthusiasm and, you know, going to one of the, the huge uh, ed tech trade shows we have. The UK really is an international leader in terms of our ed tech scene. And I mm -hmm. think when you go to something like the Bet Show in London and see the scale of what's going on in UK schools, it is quite awe inspiring. Thank you, Owen. I, I think the one from one from me is 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 aligned to that actually and it's it's about you know how many teachers go and visit other schools um and i think and that is a really difficult thing to do we're well i guess we're all fortunate because we have that opportunity to go and see schools and we go into schools and and when you're in your own school you become very sort of insular and and you're focused on the things that you have to deal with um but as i said earlier you know there are thirty thousand schools just in the uk you, you know, that there's one very, very close to you, probably. Make those links, forge those opportunities, um, often easier if you're within, a, within a, a, an academy trust, obviously. But find opportunities to go and see other people's practice. This idea, again, of sharing that good practice. You know, see what other people are doing. Learn from them. Um, I don't, it would, I would absolutely love, for there to be some sort of contractual responsibility built into a teacher's contract that say you have the entire you have three days a year are built into your contract to actually go and see other practitioners and forge those links as well because there's nothing more powerful and impactful i think than seeing one of your own your peers working with young people in classrooms using technology you know, we often do it for head teachers. That's the bizarre thing, isn't it? So, you know, NPQH and other qualifications at, at that sort of level provide you with opportunities to go and talk to other senior leaders. I don't think we do it quite well enough for, for classroom practitioners. Great point. Well, thank you. Thought-provoking and really, really helpful for me as a senior leader within a school. And hopefully our viewers will have some takeaways for, to take from it that they can take back and use within their setting. 
Um, Thanks, Sarah. Thank you.